In terms of the essence of what the nation state law states, there is nothing new except for um, two elements. Uh, one is that uh, discrimination, racism within Israel becomes an issue of a rule of the constitution, not only a rule of law, which has a lot of implications on the kind of activities that the Israeli parliament could further take in that sense. And the second is, uh, as human rights organizations, human rights lawyers, it does shrink the limited space where we could do some kind of legal action claiming for um, human rights, uh, rights based on our official status as uh, uh, citizens. Uh, and indeed, I want to focus a little bit on the role of, of the Supreme Court uh, beyond uh, what Mazin already uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, and of course, I, I don't need to explain the, the essence, the importance of the law as part of the constitutional framework. It is the law of laws. And I think it's beyond the rest of the basic laws that exist in Israel, which is human dignity and freedom, uh, occupation, uh, the, the basic law of the Knesset, and, and so on and so on. A, um, and it will have, again, its implication on uh, further trends within the Israeli um, uh, Knesset. Uh, and the, the role of the Supreme Court um, traditionally, since day one, uh, was very consistent. Uh, and in recent uh, years, we have seen year after year that all of the laws that were enacted by the Israeli Knesset, that were anti-Arab or anti-democratic as so-called, were uh, uh, paved in uh, green uh, uh, access by the Supreme Court. Uh, starting with the anti-BDS law, the Supreme Court said, I'm not going to accept the petition. Uh, Anti-Nakba law, the Supreme Court said, I'm rejecting the petition. Uh, ban on family unification law, if I have a spouse that's originated in Ramallah, in Ghazi, an American who was born in Lebanon, we cannot live in Israel. The Supreme Court said, okay, you have the right to family, but you cannot have the right as a family to live in Israel because you're Palestinian. Uh, what else was there? Um, admissions committees. It's basically a law that enacts segregation in housing in Israel. It validates a system, again, that existed since day one in hundreds of towns and villages all along Israel, from the north to the south, based on non-social suitability, based on cultural criteria. The Supreme Court said, I reject the petition. Yeah. Um, elections, and we're right before, after the elections. The elections, in order to participate, to have the right, to participate in the uh, Knesset uh, parliament elections, you have your platform <coughs> needs to fit the basic law uh, uh, of the Knesset, which basically, again, says Israel as a democratic and uh, um, Jewish state. What that means, absurdly, and I don't think you can find that anywhere else, is that every elections, the Arab <coughs> parliament members, candidates, parties, would have to stand in front of the Supreme Court, convincing the Supreme Court why they are not active in a full democratic state. Otherwise, the Supreme Court would say, you don't have the right to participate in the Knesset. By force, you have to be Zionist. Otherwise, you cannot participate in the elections. And year after, election after election, basically, part of the explanations for whomever files these motions to disqualify parties or individuals 
is their action, including bills that are put in front of the Knesset for a full democratic state, for a state that guarantees full rights for all of its citizens. If it's proven that this is the main core of your work as a parliamentarian, as a platform, the Supreme Court would say, no, Habibi, you cannot. It's, it won't work in a Jewish state. It's the day-to-day -day life of uh, the citizens of Israel. It's the day-to-day -day court decisions of the Israeli Jewish Supreme Court. Yeah. So from here, we should see the nation state law. Yeah, th this is the departure point beyond, of course, the symptomatics and, and the formality. So basically, this brings us to the, the, the question is why? Why Israel needs this? Why? I mean, it's been doing pretty much whatever it wants. It's a, democ it's, it's, it's a Jewish state. It's all segregation. It confiscated most of the Palestinian land, including the refugees and including the citizens, and the internally displaced. Um, hundreds of Jewish towns where I cannot live in. Uh, participation in the elections is limited to being by force a Zionist, or non-full democrat, let's put it this way. Um, uh, what else? Political participation, social education, uh, you name it. It's for Jewish. So why? Why do they need the law? And why now? Which brings me to the other side of the green. Yeah. Uh, and I want to connect a few things together. Last year, in 2007, in, in February 2017, the Knesset uh, enacted uh, what's known as the validation law. It's a law that basically uh, tries, attempts to validate uh, Israeli illegal settlements in the West Bank. It's basically an attempt to uh, uh, bypass the issue of the settlements that are built on private Palestinian lands where the Supreme Court has been sort of active uh, in that manner that says you can build settlements wherever you want, just leave the private lands because it's really problematic in terms of uh, international community and international attraction and, and criticism and so on and so on. The law was enacted and we petitioned against the law. Uh, and in the response of the government, which is not represented um, uh, by the Attorney General because he opposes the law, but not because he opposes the settlements, but because he thinks there are other existing legal tools to validate these settlements through the military uh, governor and through the military orders. We don't need that law. This is basically what the Supreme, but the Attorney General said. But this is not what the interesting element here. The more interesting was the government's response to the uh, petition before the Supreme Court. The government said one is that uh, the West Bank is part of the land of Israel, Eretz Israel. Two, that the Jewish people have natural right to reside anywhere they want in the land of Israel, including the West Bank. Israel has full sovereignty over the West Bank as part of Eretz Israel. Thus, the Israeli parliament has full sovereignty to enact laws that are valid in the West Bank and by no means are bound by international law. In this case, of course, international human, uh, humanitarian law and of course human rights law. So basically what the government said to the Supreme Court in this case is that we are changing the rules. No more, you know, voluntarily applying IHL because of the international community. No more this vagueness about the status of the West Bank. No more these games. It's part of the land of Israel. This is what Zionism is. Yeah. 
and we are the sovereign there. We can enact whatever we want in that area. And this is basically in legal terms, changing the basic norm. The basic norm in the occupied territories is IHL, which according to IHL, ideally, the military governor or whomever is functioning there on behalf of the occupation administration should be bound by IHL. And in no way Israeli national law. The government, through the validation law and explaining it very clear and explicit to the Supreme Court, said, no, this is part of Israel. Keep that in mind. Hold that for a little bit. Then, um, year after, the whole discussion around the nation state bill starts. And I do not think we can understand fully what the nation state uh, uh, law is, basic law is, without jumping to the other side of the green line. Because basically this is one of the core issues of the law. Uh, the Supreme Court since, uh, I think, 79, uh, they gave a court decision uh, in a case called WCAT. Uh, basically challenging uh, settlement in the West Bank built on Palestinian private land. Uh, and the discourse there was Zionist, because the settlers said, we're Zionist, we're fulfilling Zionist goals, it's part of the land of Israel, we're entitled to live there. And the Supreme Court said, that's fine, that's nice, I agree, but you, the state of Israel, the military governor, decided within the establishment of the military government in the West Bank in 67 that IHL is the basic norm there. Zionism is nice, but this is not the law. This is basically what the Supreme Court. And it's been consistent since then and uh, with a lot of problems. Yeah, basically, the Supreme Court gave green line for, for, for Israel to do whatever it wants in the uh, occupied territories, Gaza and, and the West Bank, but within the framework of IHL, basically reframing, rephrasing, reinterpreting the IHL to create something completely uh, different. And these court decisions, including more recent ones, uh, to evict uh, Amuna outpost, Ofra, and, and many others. Okay. Um, were very problematic for the right wing. Netanyahu and his group uh, who are governing uh, the government. Keep in mind that also the issue of the status of the West Bank is not within the Israeli consensus. It's very controversial, including within the Israeli uh, Zionist liberals. So what the nation state law came to say, no more confusion. I want to put this notion of the West Bank as part of Eretz Israel, which Article 1A, I think, of the nation state law states explicitly. That the land of Israel, not the state of Israel, is the historic land of the Jewish people. And they have full right over the whole territory. Yeah. So basically the law comes and says, I want to normalize what I think as a true good Zionist obligation of the West Bank as part of my obligation towards uh, uh, my people and no more controversies and it's not any law it's a basic law it's part of the constitutional um, uh, norm it's part of sustainability of this new constitutional norm from now on the Knesset will be obligated uh, by this constitutional norm the Supreme Court will be obligated by this constitutional norm uh, and so on. So, so, so basically what we have here. Uh, um, I, I saw in earlier uh, uh, 
second class citizen. And I don't think truly that describes what's happening. <laughs> yeah, because, we, and, and we've never been, since day one, second class citizens. I, do th I think it's a distortion or a wrong, inaccurate, let's put it this way, reading of the reality. Yeah, because in the 70s, the Supreme Court said, you, we, ha we have no Israeli nationality. We have Jewish nationality, and we have other nationalities, which makes Israel different from any other people like to compare. You know, Australia, Aborigines, US, the Indians. No, it's different. It's completely different. From day one, Israeli law and the Supreme Court said, no, we're the, you're the other. And you're the unwanted other. And you're the obstacle. We are the Jewish people. We are, have the right since whatever, 2,000 years ago here. And you're the other. And you're the unwanted other. And that's not second class citizen. You have one group that's superior. And you have another group that's inferior. You have dominated. And you have dominated. Yeah. Uh, segregation. As Jewish people, you can do whatever they want, you, you want. In all of Eretz Israel, within the Green Line, outside the Green Line, all of the territory is open for you. In a segregatory matter. Because of Zionism. Uh, so basically, no right of return. And, and by the way, I mean, the implication of the law will say not only no right of return within the Green Line, but also in the West Bank. It will have it, it will, huge implications there. Um, so with these characterization, I, I don't think yani, you can speak again of, of uh, you can only speak of, of, of a colonizer and, and colonizer. I don't think you can frame it in any democratic sort of or travel democratic way. I, I don't think that accurately describes what's happening in uh, uh, Israel, Palestine. I, I would have to stop here, I believe. Thank you very much. Thank you.